The elegy to me, and why I say it's fierce, is because it's endured millennia. It's been with us forever. It's the first form. Joy and sorrow, they share a very complex ecosystem. They are, they are one, you know, and you cannot have one without the other. And I believe that joy can be amplified by sorrow. That's how we understand it. So the three things that I most love about poetry and what I'm interested in is mystery, mm -hmm. presence, and intimacy. Got it. Oh, yes, it's scary. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally prepared feeling now. Spook. You smoking a regular cigarette and a vape at the same time? I put the cigarette out. Shut up. <laughs> I, I, I just I just got the cigarettes. Shut up. All right. So all righty. Happy Father's Day. Oh great. <laughs> um nothing but ghosts for me. But yeah. you know, the father comes up in this. You know, I have a few things to say about this once we get into it. Um, but yeah, why don't you like do whatever you do to kick it off? Do you have something you say? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm Bianca Stone and I'm a crazy person. Totally. I'm the mad woman at the mic. There you go. It's nice to see you though. And I'm happy it's to do so... that. I'm nice to do, I'm happy to do this with you. Yeah. I'm so happy to have you. I mean, yeah. you're, I, I've been wanting to have you on the podcast anyway, but yeah. um, I, I feel like Roka, you know, I feel a kinship to Roka in the way that I feel a kinship to you as a poet. So I feel like we deal in the same kinds of themes. We and, do. We yeah. do. And um, yeah. And there's a lot I can say about that too, actually. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. And we'll get there. Hi, I'm Bianca Stone. <laughs> Welcome to the Odin Psyche podcast. We're here again, folks. I'm talking on the podcast today with my dear friend and colleague uh peter gizzy and we're working through the duino elegies and today we're looking at rainer maria rilke's fourth elegy the fourth elegy and i been wanting to have peter on the podcast anyway to talk about um his poetry and his interests and i knew that the fourth elegy would be a perfect one in which to do that, especially today when we're recording on Father's Day. Peter Gizzi teaches at UMass MFA program. He's the author of numerous books of poetry and chat books, including Now It's Dark, In Defense of Nothing, Selected Poems from 1987 to 2011. And Peter, I felt like it was so perfect to have you on for a Duino Elegy episode because your most recent book is called Fierce Elegy. And these are all from Wesleyan University Press. So, uh, Peter's books, I mean. So I I wanted to, I was thinking of starting off today, meditating on the word elegy itself, because in fact, uh, it's not something we've talked about yet on the podcast. And the way that Rilke uses the word elegy in this collection and his and the the elegy as a form isn't traditionally i think how we think of elegy in this book in these poems and well i said that really shittily say it <laughs> the again. Way, yeah i'll say it again i was really interested in the way that roca uses the elegy form and even decided to to use elegy as uh the form for these poems because it's not a traditional use of the elegy. It's not as straightforward as we would think. And um it with that, you know, that said, his obsession with the unseen and seen elements of living and the dead is pervasive in this book, as is love and loss. And there's so much nuance to these terms yes. that he explores in the elegies and that I see you exploring, Peter, in your poems and in Fierce Elegy. So I wanted you to start by talking about how you see the elegiac working as a form in your own poems, but mm -hmm. in poetry in general. 
Sure. Um, it's great to be here with you, Bianca. Um, it's always lovely to have the occasion to be in conversation. Um, so yeah, the elegy to me, and why I say it's fierce, is because it's endured millennia. It's been with us forever. It's the first form. And if you take it at its most elemental, to lament is also an act of love. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you're right about the way that Rilke uses elegy. I think he uses it in a way that actually is, um, for me, uh, I feel akin with because, I mean, there's so many things to say. For instance, if we forget what we've lost, then we've lost everything, basic. But the other piece of it is joy and sorrow they share a very complex ecosystem. They are, they are one, you know, and you cannot have one without the other. And I believe that joy can be amplified by sorrow. And with, that's how we understand it. And so to me, the elegy is never really a form. It's more like an environment or, um, yeah, an orientation to the world. Can I keep talking? Should I keep? Because okay. the most basic, yeah. the, the, most, the most basic way why I liked it and why I use it here and why probably my soul has always been interested in this particular vantage. And I've been reading Rilke since I've been 20, um, is that we live in this moment, particularly now in the 21st century, where there's, because of digital culture, we're living in this incredibly accelerated, you know, moment of all of these interlocking crises that have absolutely no resolution. So why is the elegy useful then? Because the one way, because you know, nobody can agree on anything, right, out there. And so the one thing that we can come to rest in and say, this is a reasonable way to understand objective reality, which is periodicity. Nothing is here forever. We're all just here for a moment, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like the whole human record is not even the life of a gnat in the face of the sun, you know? We're basically a mirage. So, so the idea of periodicity, right, that, that everything's in a constant state of change, to me, okay, so we can all agree on that basic fact, and so that's a ground, and then within that ground, there's a couple of things, you know, Oppen says the self is no mystery, the mystery is we want to be here, we have something to stand on, we want, you know, what do you say, the act of being, the act of being more than oneself, um, mm. so... That if seems we, like something Roka would be interested in. Interested in. Well, I sure. think Roka, I think Roka is tapping into like, yeah, what poetry is all about, which is basically how do you make something absolutely present while it's absolutely haunted? How do you make something that's always forward looking while it's also you know backward looking? And hmm. so, and it basically disrupts a notion of linear time it disrupts the notion of the clock it makes us realize that you know time is like it's like it's an outer force and Rilke does have this moment at Duino Castle a place I went to when I was 24 I made a pilgrimage there Love and that. and uh yeah I was staring through the gates and there was an elderly gentleman elegant man pruning a rose bush it would turn out and uh and I was standing there and he looked at me and he went, bravato. He like waved his hand, go away. And I didn't leave. And then this woman came down, um, probably his assistant and said, you know, this is private property. Um, why are you here? I told her my love of made a pilgrimage, you know, the Dwino elegies, Rilke is so important to me. And so then she went back and then she came back and then she let me on the grounds and I got to oh. walk the cliffs. Um, but that said, he has an experience which he talks about a year later in a notebook in Spain, that when he was there in the grounds, he also has this incredibly heightened sense of connection with the natural world. And it means a couple of things. You know, for him, it's a mystical experience. And in fact, you know, when we're actually in total tuning with the natural world or they're just the world around us, that is you know, a fairly enlightened way of being, but it was, it struck him. And it also said that it had no language for him. And then he goes on to say that I was on the other side of nature. Mm. And that's interesting, right? Because so he's really interested in besidedness, you know, 
uh, to be adjacent to. Because, you know, I don't know. I mean, poetry's always been a haunted medium. I mean, just basically because it uses language, which is bigger than us, older than us. It yeah. doesn't live in us. We live in it. So the notion of dictation that language comes to one, you know, makes complete sense. And so for the elegies and for poetry and why I identify and maybe you is that when I'm writing, I'm not speaking. I'm being mm. spoken. I'm being spoken, mm. right? Mm. The pronoun I doesn't belong to Peter Gizzi or Bianca Stone. Right. We share it. It belongs to everyone. Right. It's a really interesting thing. Like we think this, you know, individualness, but the I is actually wound and sprung with all of this historical consciousness and all these affiliated voices. And when we sit down to write as poets, those energies are with us, you know? That, I mean... You wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here if we didn't read things that changed our lives, that gave us wings, you know? So those voices are forever now wedded to whatever voice we create on the page. Well, it's so interesting. You bring up so many good points. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I it, talk too much. It, yeah. It's it's a good thing to have a problem with on a podcast. But his being that that statement, I, I, I was on the other side of nature and it was without language. But and also that beingness in the world, that seamlessness with there's this element of the natural landscape that is so important to the Duino elegies because that first line to, came to him at that location on the wind, you know, with that mm -hmm. dramatic backdrop. But it also was the context of his life. It also was the context of his depression and what uh, all that led to that moment and um. And the things at hand that that were part of that that's that so there's this idea of the greater consciousness of work at work in the natural landscape in the natural world which he's always talking about the difference being we are the ones who think about it in almost like binaries right so in yeah. that in the in the fourth elegy when he's saying oh at this at, in one moment like the moment that we bloom we also think of fading so we can't you know the lion that the lion isn't aware of his majesty any more than he's aware of his weakness i mean yes in, ter in terms of thought you know in terms of thinking about it to a point of almost like paralysis maybe is the issue too is that we are we're, we're unable to be in the world a little bit because of our language that um yeah. because being on maybe on this side of that idea of language but there's this idea of language the language uh, I, I don't know uh, uh, the other side of nature <laughs> yeah, I know. Where, where language maybe is when we think of that un, you know when you think of that un, where is that unseen force that is bringing the language to us if the eye is an eye who's speaking if not i not i but the wind blows through me well how how is that intelligence and consciousness and beingness of the wind where is that coming from and what is the language on that side of things if we're on this side right so we won't know we don't know we're half filled masks who only half understand everything um mm -hmm. we're getting ahead a little bit but there was something else Fine. you said there was something else you said that was uh i i had been thinking about before we started talking and is your incredible poem in your newest book called I Am Who Sent Me. Um, yeah, everyone loves that poem. That poem is like a total enigma to me. Literally, everyone quotes it. In everyone reviews. does? That's I, so it's funny. It's crazy because oh. it's like, it's the most mysterious. It's like, oh, what well, is that's, there you go. Right. <laughs> well, you were basically saying what the, you were saying in that. I mean, I love the yeah. whole book beginning to end is all. It's a piece. It's, it's a piece. all that poem, too. Um yeah. That's interesting. But but there's something you said in the first line to have died in youth and remain. Exactly. Now, there's a different kind of elegy that occurs with the living, and that seems to be one of mourning various deaths. There's right. There's a sort of like I was thinking of the death of selves or like certain parts of us that are killed in childhood and then that we're haunted by right and this if this ephemeral mm -hmm. this constant ephemeral aspect of being alive in this world is always at work then we're constantly being haunted 
we're constantly mourning, we're constantly killing different and and being killed in different ways psychically too well things right? are just changing so, everything just like all matter right. is in a constant state of change you know so you know i, I mean because to me like the elegy in this instance the way you're yeah. speaking to it is not really melancholy as much as it is survival it's like okay this is the condition of being everything's right. in a state of change nothing okay i accept it right and so to me, it's like, okay, so then how do we survive these things? This is this is a way that I have a valence in which I can kind of like, I don't know, like just inhabit that notion of surviving. And um But it's weird that elegy would in many ways be about living. Mm, it and is. I, I it's again, how can you know about life if you don't understand death? Right. right? So that or line that you talked about. Um, to have died in youth and remain to be good with that. Um, that's a very personal line. Right, right. It's interesting. It's interesting. So many people like to, think to relate to it. For me, you know, it's like because I, it's Father's Day. So, you know, um, when I was 12 in the living room, waiting for my father to come home with my mother watching a movie, they interrupted the show and said a plane has crashed in Albany and then they showed us the crash and it was my father's plane. Jesus. Yeah. So that was a really severe rending moment in my early life, right. which took me many years to kind of unpack, right? And understand. Of course, of course, but now, yeah. but now I realize I could not be who I am without that. Right. And, and that I've honored it by, you know, like, I don't name things like I don't write autobiographical verse. I, I don't name them like right, me, right. I write out of it. And to name it to me only kind of oh, the cheapens it. It just doesn't interest me. I'm interested in the kind of larger horizon. But the thing is, what it gave me, Bianca, what I realized, the gift that I was given from that, you know, very, you know, I don't know, it's a tragic moment, you know, learning that things could just change in a second and so haphazardly. But what I grew up with, I realized, was a native understanding of irrevocability. Mm. And it's always and that loss gave me eyes. Mm. It gave me eyes, and I could actually then finally see. Yeah. And seeing in the Rilke moment when he's connected to nature is like it's that it's that moment when, you know, we've all had, at least I have, I'm sure you have, is that all of a sudden you're standing and the world is just the volumes turned up and the world is just happening all around you. And you realize very, you know, the grieving subject understands this thing that Rilke is talking about in the sense that you're, it's got nothing to do with you. It's mm. like the world has absolutely nothing to do with you. It's just ongoing. And sometimes I've experienced that sense of ongoingness in the sense that I'm just a piece of it, like a tree or anything else. It's like, it's not about me you know, and it really can't be finely uncombed. But then within that, what's beautiful is that we do find a way to connect and to love and to remember and to honor. So it's an interesting dichotomy, but it is a mystical thing when you realize that you're beside the world, you know, it's like to be in the world, but not of it or that beautiful moment in Nightwood and Juna Barnes' book when Nora Flood goes to see the doctor and she climbs six stairs and he's very impoverished. She's kind of shocked that this brilliant interlocutor, larger than life, lives in this one room and he's wearing a gown and a, and a wig and he's rouged and she's going to ask him about the night and then he's, you know, she sees the doctor and she's shocked. And he says, see, you can ask me anything. So, and then this is what she says, though, and I've always loved this. He, she said, he dresses to lie beside himself, who is so constructed that love for him could only be something special. And I've always really been, mm -hmm. I've always loved that because the idea is I can love and I can be beside it. And, mm -hmm. and I realized that there's both the experience of, you know, of the present, but then there's also this other ongoing open time, right? Mm -hmm. And poems go into open time. That's where they go. It's like they disrupt the clock, which is law, labor, property, patriotism, patriarchy, et cetera. 
and it disrupts that particular mechanism and it opens up like these elegies, like our poetry, hopefully, it opens up to what I want to call fugitive time or open time or sacred time or ritual time, another, another time signature. And that to me is one of the great mechanics and one of the great things that poetry can do. And that's always interested me because all of a sudden I'm present to something much bigger than just where I'm dwelling in the moment. Like the present is so much larger. And, you know, he does this in that last moment. It's interesting. I began with interlocking crises and it begins with the thing you're talking about. It's like, we can, we can comprehend flowering and fading. It's like, it's like the mind is disturbed. It can't come to rest. It can choose this. It can choose that, which has kind of like been so accelerated now with all the various media we're, we're forced to live with. But then he comes at the end, finally, he, you know, he works through it, but he says, you know, who will show a child just as it is? Who will place it within its constellation with a measure of distance in its hand? Who will make its death from gray beard that grows hard or leave it there within the round mouth like the choking core of a sweet apple? Minds of murderers are easily divined, but this though, death, the whole of death, even before life's begun, to hold it all so gently and be good. This is beyond description. Mm -hmm. That ending is remarkable because it's kind of what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, to have died in youth and be good. You know, it's interesting. I, I don't know. I mean, people are always making me think about that line. Mm. But it's you here. Want... It's here in this poem. Do you want to read the... Why Which don't you, one... read... Why don't read, you read, read the fourth elegy? Which one do you want me to read the the snow or the or the um the, the which one do you want me to read? Well, I have the snow here, so let's do that. Let's yeah. do that. Um, okay. So all right, so we're reading uh, Edward Snow's translation of the Rilke's fourth, fourth elegy. elegy. Yeah. Okay. The fourth elegy. O oh, trees of life, how far off is winter? We're in disarray. Our minds don't commune like those of migratory birds left behind and late. We force ourselves suddenly on winds and fall, exhausted on indifferent waters. Blooming makes us think of fading, and somewhere out there lions still roam, oblivious in all their splendor to any weakness. We, though, even when intent on one thing wholly, already feel the cost exacted by some other. Conflict is our next of kin. Aren't lovers always reaching borders, each in the other, despite the promise of vastness, royal hunting, home? Then, for an instant's virtuoso sketch, a ground of contrast is prepared, laboriously, so we can see it. For they're very clear with us, we don't know our feelings contour, only what shapes it from outside. Who hasn't sat anxiously before his heart's curtain? It rose, the scenery for parting, easy to understand, the familiar garden swaying slightly, then the dancer, not him, enough. However light his entrance, he's in disguise and turns into a burger who enters his kitchen to reach his living room. I loathe watching these half-filled masks give me the puppet. At least it's real. I can take the hollow body and the wire and the face and its pure surface. Right here, I'm out in front. Even when the lights go out, even when someone says to me, it's over, even when from the stage a gray gust of emptiness drifts toward me, even when not one silent ancestor sits beside me anymore, not a woman, not even the boy with a brown squint eye, I'll sit here anyway. One can always watch. Aren't I right, you, father, from whom life turned so bitter when you tasted mine? That first murky influx of what would feed my drives, who kept on sampling it as I grew older and intrigued by the aftertaste of so strange a future, tried looking through my vague upward gaze. You, father, who since your death have been here often in my hope, far inside me, afraid, forfeiting the equanimity the dead possess, whole kingdoms of equanimity from my bit of fate. Aren't I right? And you, woman, aren't I right? 
who love me for that small, hesitating love for you I always veered from, because I felt the realm in your faces, even as I loved it, changing into world space where you were absent. What if I do choose to wait in front of the puppet stage? No, to stare with so much force that finally to counteract my stare, an angel will arrive here as an actor and jolt life into those hard husks. Angel and puppet, then finally the play begins. Then what we kept apart simply by our presence here conjoins. Then from the separate seasons of our life, that one great wheel of transformation arises above us, beyond us, the angel plays. The dying, surely they must guess how full of pretext is all that we achieve here. Nothing is what it is. O oh, childhood hours, when behind each shape there was more than mere past and before us, not the future. True, we were growing and often we spurred ourselves to grow up faster, half for the sake of those who had nothing left but their grownness. And yet, off alone, we were happy with what stayed the same. And we stood there in the space between world and plaything upon a spot which, from the first beginning, had been established for pure event. Who shows a child just as he is? Who places him in a constellation and hands him the measure of distance and interval? Who makes a child's death out of gray beard that hardens or leaves in it his round mouth like the core of a beautiful apple? Murderers are easily understood, but this, one's death, the whole reach of death, even before one's life is underway, to hold it gently and not feel anger is indescribable. Mm. So great. It's just, it's just, I mean, you can like pause at every four lines. It's so beautiful. Yeah. You know, um, what do you, what did you respond to most just now? If you did. For some reason, I really responded to then from the separate seasons of our life, that one great wheel of transformation arises. I know it's beautiful. I, 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 I you know, well, well, okay. The angel, the angel and puppet. Then, finally, the play begins. Then, what we keep apart simply by our presence can join. So, mm -hmm. this, this, you know, and I've just ended my therapy. <laughs> um, I just ended my um, um, weekly therapy, and so I have been thinking a lot about that event in your life, like the major event of coming to change like really foundational change and at the same time dealing with things that stay the same and like even mm. changes that's even changes is, is seeing that seeing things that are constant and things that change and trying to figure that out but in that moment of that that conjoining of uh of um understanding and 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 contrasts and ambivalences and and holding them together even life and death right even that that blooming and fading idea mm. you know when when you come to a change in your life it's almost like a moment of of holding those two things at the same time in the hand right yeah so I, but but that when he said that great wheel that that seasons of our life that one great wheel of transformation arises I don't know. I just felt this. Mm -hmm. I felt that. Well, yeah. I mean, it's really, it's a moment, I think, where he is, you know, almost accepting this notion that um, we bloom and fade at the same time, that the wheel is constantly changing and we're on this thing. But angel and puppet, right? I mean, like one's mystical and of the imagination and the puppet is artifice and yet it is also depicted and comes to life through imagination it's an interesting choice angel and puppet it's like so you know i mean in one creepy way is he saying we're just like funhouse dolls and the dead put words in our mouth you oh, know jesus i you know you know what i'm saying is yeah it, is, it, is it dark <laughs> like that you know because well, I, I, you know you know who references that is 
you know, Jack Spicer has those five imaginary elegies. And right. he's definitely coming. I mean, he's Rilke. Yeah. It was, he, you mean he knew, to the ones to Lorca? No. Um, oh. Earlier poems called just the imaginary elegies. And uh, yeah, I mean, I could well, go get. The, I, yeah, go, 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 go. I mean, my mind just went somewhere else. Go ahead. But yeah. Well, I, I, I was, I was, I, I thought, you know, um, I kept thinking of uh, the um, importance of, of what he's getting at in this idea of the puppet and the half-filled masks. He keeps saying in this poem, aren't I right? Aren't I right? Aren't yeah. I right? Nothing is what it is. Mm -hmm. That he, you know, he's trying to convince himself, I think, too. I think these things are, are shaky and and, comp and, and conflicting, mm -hmm. but but nothing is what it is, 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 a, is a point he's making that he embraces this performance, this scene, this cur even the curtain of the heart. Okay, I know. We're, wait we're waiting for the curtain of the heart to part, the, 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 the stage of the heart, the theater of a heart. And, and, um, and this, so the scene, this theater, this act, now, of course, what is that? That's art. That is mm -hmm. art. That is people making art. Even the puppet is something that humans have built. Yes. Right? Nothing else in nature is building a puppet. So, there's this really interesting thing that's happening where he sees the natural animals and children as all as more authentic and seamlessly at, in the world. And, and we are blind. We're half filled masks who are actually blind because we think we're whole by through the lover or whatever, our denial and our delusion. But it's this, this, there's something more authentic in the persona. Now, getting back to how you started this whole conversation. I'm not the I, right? The mm -hmm. moment that, and you as a wonderful teacher would know this in terms of helping students understand the power of what they can do in a poem. The I is not the I. The I is, is, is this incredible opportunity to not be the I and to be, and once you fully embrace the persona of self, and it's not just, it's not like, it's not like a gimmick, right? It's not like a gimmick of art. It's actually somehow getting at something of what it means to have language itself is that there's this like performative persona self at work and that we, that we perform all the time, these little scenes of the, of what we don't see, of what we don't understand about our own minds are the, and the unconscious, right? The unconscious, right? So we, these performances of the unconscious, there's something so there's something about art that he's getting at here. I feel like subtly. Oh, yeah. I think that's, or really even lovely. unconsciously. I think that's lovely. And um, that what he's speaking to is art as this other valence. And maybe it's the true valence in, in terms of Rilke's imagination as a poet, but you're also right that um, if the pronoun I doesn't, belong to it's like a persona that one creates it's an act it's a theater then there's also like you know the the body incarnate the somatic instrument that's writing it is like is also just beside that persona because it's mm. not peter gizzy we're just next to peter gizzy and um so that's a piece of it you know it's like walt whitman the person the voice he creates in those poems is not who he was right that's a that's a that that that's a made thing. That but isn't voice. it? The, is there some element? And now we want, but now we want to say that that's the poet. This is what we do. And in a way, that is the poet because the poet but, has right. now created a being. It's created a personhood. You know, I, I, right? So I I love this idea that you know in in the the idea of course poet the poet is maker the poet as maker that the poet in the act of writing the poem is maker and not poet, and this is important and mysterious. But there's there's something okay. So this idea too of the fool uh, and lying that's aligned with poets. But there's that's the way to get at a truer sense of reality, which I feel like that's what Rilke is. That's what he's saying in this poem. It is it, there's to use our uh, there's an ontological curse in I think therefore I am right. Mm -hmm. So there there's this. The, the act of our self-consciousness is a burden 
in his in the in the you know it starts off so vehement in the beginning of this mm -hmm. poem except when we accept it and it, embrace the performative act of it and create something out of it and there's something to that weird move right. of, of having the angel come right so there's some element of divine interaction um to complete the uh yeah, yeah the, no the, the act the, the circuit yeah yeah mm -hmm. i think yeah i think you're speaking about this really i, I yeah it's really great actually it's very useful um useful personally <laughs> not as useful personally <laughs> i'm like I, i'm like i like the fact that you bring in therapy it's like stop it stop it yeah stop bringing it up well there, it's there but it's not there like it's like this is bigger than therapy oh i know therapy is just it it's so true because it's you get to perform this other thing that you desire it's like you know it's like poem like we're voting like what's a, a votive it's a it's a wish it's a prayer it's a desire mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we get to build another reality that's not linked entirely to family of origin or one surroundings right it's like it's it's not entirely just made of that it's made of that and something else so there's like the angel and the puppet or this uh, this idea that it's a made thing that it's a theater um so i never liked the therapeutic model but you well, know it, but, the, but, but because we, you have to transcend the idea that the, you, you know the therapeutic model will address the the autobiographical origins of your traumas in which to address why you do what you do right and I think but, that I just, but you have to transcend that you could that become that you that falls away like old dead skin you know it becomes so in this creepy way meaningless even though it still haunts you you know even well, though it's still so I tell you about this extraordinarily rendered moment in my early life it means exactly. not it means nothing to say it what's more interesting is it's how it's bloomed in me throughout my life and given me a way to yes. like to to have yes. to have eyes to be here. And in many <laughs> ways, that is how I've honored that person. I mean, it's like it's so exhausting to be alive. It's just it's so expensive. Mm -hmm. If you're at all awake, I mean, the I news just... the news that comes in every day is just exhausting. It's just like. I don't know. I mean, where we're going and what we've become as a species is so, it's just like, it's so impoverished. I don't understand. And it's happening faster and faster in my life. I have years on you. So, you know, I spent the first 40 plus years of my life without any of this stuff, like in the world, you know, where there was none of this. And now it's like, I don't know. I just, I don't think it, I don't think we're, I don't think the human mind or the human is meant to move at the rate that computing does or the digital mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. or, you know, the phone we carry. We're not supposed mm -hmm. to have that much information on no. us at any moment. And it's actually meaningless in a way to have it. So. Well, talk about not being present in the world because I've talked about this with other people too, is that there's this anxiety that happens when you have social media and the computer and everything where it feels like that's more of the real world than the real world is and somehow well it is for many people yeah yeah you have to address the real world i've got to go onto the real world and check in you know like and see how it's going on there like i have to take a picture of this book i'm reading because otherwise yeah, yeah. it's not real you know like i have to make my this event i'm at real by posting about it um and and i and i don't want to like hate on I don't want to, I'm not being black and white about it, right? No, it's a, it's a tool. I mean, the only reason I, yeah, I got on it because I just use it for Peter Gizzy Industries, you know? Right. I just let people know what's going on. Otherwise, I don't know how people know what's going and, on. And the, the the wonderful friendships I've had with like-minded minds that yeah. I am so grateful for. Yeah. Um. But, you know, Roka would be shocked because, I mean, it's a much harder time of it of doing what he calls in seeing, which he learned from Rodin, which is looking, mm -hmm. looking, looking, looking. And, you know, I've had these moments of like, you know, one and, and I'll say this about what what 
one thing that happened in psychoanalysis too is like I had this moment of being like how much am I seeing outward? How much am I trapped in a kind of not seeing inward or outward? I'm mm. in this sort of like liminal space of not seeing anything, you know? And it's, I, to, I, I've been, tr I've been trying so hard to look at, at the world, you know, and, and look at nature and see things. And it's brutal too, like, you know, seeing birds get hit by cars in front of you and, and all the, the, De environmental devastation and everything that's we don't want to look of course we don't want to look but and then all the lives that are being taken and all the the, the and war disgusting you know? war and the and um violence is just it's so hard to look but it's but we are nature i mean the idea that like you know what makes our hands makes everything else on the planet and kind of basically it makes almost everything else that's in the multiverse right yeah what we're, what we're made of is like made of everything yeah um, like that it's like i think if people actually just focused on the fact that it's like a total miracle and mystery to be here we might, <laughs> yeah. actually, we might actually celebrate the fact that we're not here for long you know um at any rate and we got we left we got off topic i know we did um this is but you're talking about the elegies great that that we can keep true okay so hmm. it's this part about the father is really weird too. Um, you it father is. for whom life turned so bitter when you tasted mine. And it's not a capitalized father either. Mm -mm. Um, there, there is a, I mean, he uses the word bitter, but there's a bitterness in that line. Turned so bitter when you're, you're who, you father for whom life turned so bitter when you tasted mine. I know. And it's the same line in the snow. It's pretty much exact in the um in the in the other one, in the um oh, spender yeah. spender Leishman. I'm gonna look it up here in this other you know, the one I first got, by the way, was this David Young translation. And let me just show you what it looks like. It's like it's like William's variable Whoa. foot. And it works brilliantly because all those long German clauses, then they just it's beautiful. Oh, yeah, I, this, this is it's an amazing translation. I loved it. Um, but where the father thing? Let's go. Okay, there. so that's at the. Don't the you talk. think? Don't you think I'm right? You father, whose life tasted so bitter after you tasted mine, the first thick doses of my necessity, still tasting again and again as I grew up and intrigued by the aftertaste of such a strange future tried out my cloudy gaze you my father who so often since your own death have had fears about me deep in my own hope giving up the calm that the dead have surrendering whole kingdoms of calm for my morsel of fate it's so weird it's just like whole well, it, just, of calm. It, it just keeps turning right but this is the weird yeah, part yeah you my father who so often since your own death have had fears about me like, yeah, like how would he even know that? Well, it's like it's it's a very interesting address. It's just yeah. like okay. I mean, you know, um it's so weird like where he's speaking from, you know, yeah. and like Rosemary Walter, who I love and who's like, you know, unimpeachably brilliant and a translator from the German and the French. Um, you know, when I was younger, it's like I really love Rilke. She said, Yes, that's uh I did too, but no longer. Oh, really? Well, just because did she, she give a reason why. Yeah, she just feels like it's, um, uh, you know, I think for her, it's just too, like, mystical. Mm, and yeah. she's actually into, like, if you can't say it, it doesn't exist. I don't know. I just, yeah, it's it's just not, it's too soft for her in some way, or too romantic. I actually think it really speaks to her own background and how in many ways as one does has to leave that you know and her father mm -hmm. was into astrology mm -hmm. and he was into mystical things and uh as was the third reich so you know she was a little girl during that and uh you know i it's interesting like she can't listen to Mahler or wagner you know those okay. things so these very high yeah. teutonic things she's 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 walked away from maybe she finds them that in their totality uh, vision they can also be instruments of um be misused i don't know it's interesting but yeah no she kind of scoffed at me in my youth 
It's something I remember. I, I didn't judge it, like, you know, whatever. I think. Yeah. Well, it's I, kind I, of I it's I a never, blow when somebody you yeah. are, is like, oh, Rilke. Well, I, I like you know, you'll, I, you'll grow up. You'll grow out of that. I know people, you know, are always like, oh, I, you know, I don't read the, the letters to a young poet. That's like only for young people. You know, I read it recently and I was like, I didn't feel i didn't get this when i was younger like now yeah, no, i get it you know it's, like it's, no i, I don't, agree yeah. I, it's funny because i i feel like it's easy it would it, it, they were written to a young man yes but um but i think it takes time to see those but it's different but too if i you think grow up but, a german but if you grow up german but, you know, but here's you, the, yeah yeah but here's the thing in those right so he's addressing a young man but Basically, what they're really about is an opportunity for him to think about an art he spent his life in, right? So yeah. that's why right. that's why they're not just for the young, right? They're for no. us because it's really like you know a seasoned veteran, like yeah. giving the benefit of their mind. And I always took away from that my favorite thing, and what I liked about it when I was young was he copies out his sonnet. And that's like a great honor, right? And so I love this. I mean, when I was younger, I would, you know, I would like a commonplace book. I would write things with my hand of things that I read that I love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And me too. And there's, there's kind of a way of just like taking it into your body. It's a way of like yeah. being with it in this other way yeah. that's, you know, and that was my favorite gesture in that book that I loved was that. And that was generous of him. And, you know, um, whether is it Christopher, whether he was happy with that, I don't know. I think he was thrilled. Yeah. I mean, he's kind of the reason they were published. I think he 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 tracked down the He was very proud. Yeah. Yeah. Um I mean, but the Twino elegies, right? I mean, they're all of a piece. They do focus on different things, some on love, some on death, some on adulthood, some on childhood, some on the mystical. And but they're really kind of all just one vocal fabric and even though what makes them really, to me, have such impact is that they were written over such a long period of time. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess what I love about Rilke and why I respect his art is that it's kind of also confident. As much as he despaired, he had to have some kind of incredible sense of, of equanimity because he could just take his time. And it was, you know, years for yeah, a decade, yeah. right? And it's beautiful. It's like Stevens writes his first, he publishes his first book when he's 44. Okay, whatever. He doesn't publish his next book for 13 years. Wow. And it's a 52 page book, Ideas of Order. It doesn't suck, by the way, but I'm just saying, but it's like yeah. 52 pages 13 years later. We think of Oppen 25 years. Wow. So, so but we're just, very rushed now. Well, that's the thing. And there's way too much poetry. I mean, it's like I haven't written a poem. I mean, I'm not writing. It, it happens after I finish a book. I can't write if I don't have something to say, Bianca. Mm, I hate that feeling. And I don't want to, I don't write to write. I'm not one of those people. I mean, when I was younger, sure, it was an active will, but now I realize it's way bigger than me. And, um, and it's, it's such a privilege. It's you know, it's majesty. comforting to hear that. You know, some people are so prolific and I feel all this pressure to like i i want so badly to write something but yeah, yeah. I, I i don't i know i hate the feeling of things that haven't like and i kind of feel like everything is a little bit of a failure <laughs> but I hate, feel, I hate feeling like i published something that i I, I didn't spend enough time on or or I rushed or I pushed or forced or something like well that. some things some things just come i mean like some you know it's like I mean, the muse will give you a poem, give you a poem or two, but she'll never yeah. give you, she'll never give you a book. So, you know, no, it's, it's no, like, it's true. so it's like, it is just kind of, you know, gift and struggle, but, um, but I found too you're doing just fine. I mean, yeah. I think it's great that you don't publish a book every two years. I yeah. do. Yeah. I, I can't. I, I, I don't want to actually. Yeah. I just don't write that way. Um, There's just but too much poetry anyway. There is too much poetry and, and it's, it sucks because I I tell people a lot like in when I talk with them for manuscript consults and things like I, I mean I know the desire like if you've been trying to get your book out for fifteen years you know well, that's it's a whole like, that's, it's, that's a that thing. sucks but yeah. like you know a lot of people too it's like they want to get a book out so bad and I'm like well the the problem is is that a lot of times people get books out and they're still really depressed because nobody reviewed it 
and they can't get it in bookstores and there's a whole other set of problems you know well that's so the exhausting I, part of being a poet it's, yeah it it's really expensive and it's expensive to write and it's expensive to live because yeah. what you realize is there's really nothing out there i had this horrible student who i won't name years ago something I mean, horrible whatever just like dim and you know the major the majority of the people I work with are like just like stunning and remarkable. Like, you know, it's just been beautiful as of late. And uh yeah, I love my students. But this person was like, So what was it like to be a finalist for the national? He kept asking me this question. You know, I was like, I don't know. It was like 12 weeks of my life. And weirdly, it was embarrassing. So yeah, I don't yeah. I don't I don't really remember it. And yeah, it's, and it's kind of like prize culture and all that stuff, it means nothing. You know, yeah. and it's, I don't know, I, I think it's a drag that we have that in arts, because mm -hmm. I think it really provincializes it, right? And I don't, I don't really believe in the culture of it. And I actually think I don't write for anything other than the poetry gods. But I love that's that. my goal, the fact that you admire my work. Right. That's what I was just going to say. That, that's, that, like, my, that's my yeah. prize. That's my right. prize. I'm like, that, if, if, if uh, someone, uh, if Peter likes my work, I'm like so happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, another, if a poet I truly admire, I think is real, likes my work, yeah. younger, older, you know, that's it. I mean, you know, yeah. and like you, I'm old. I knew a lot of people who are gone now who yeah. I was really lucky to have their favor, you know? Right. And, but the other thing as a young person, I just never took on the arguments of my elders because I realized like with Rosemary, it's like they've earned it. Like they have a reason for it. Uh -huh. I'm not taking it on. But I remember coming up, people would take on the arguments of this. I was like, it made no sense to me. Like I had a You mean like, for instance, like, they oh, just you read Rocco. Like you're not going to be like, they would, yeah, yeah. You're not going to yeah. like start just repeating how she feels about Rocco as That's your right. own feelings. No. Yeah. In fact, I respect her opinion because I know it comes from a place of measured thought you know she has a reason for it yeah and it's poetry is such a personal in a way like it is we, she has such a like you were saying on she can't listen to wagner and things you know she has these other reasons why it, and there's no reason why we all have to like the same thing at the same time at all yeah and there's the things you liked at one point that you it's like i like that yeah and, that, and then and then there's the things like I don't know, and then you come to it like five years later. It's like, oh, wait a minute. I mean, I, mean, I do. I didn't. I remember. I never liked Roka. I was like, what is this? You know, it just seemed so cheesy. Like I don't know. I thought cheesy. it was kind of like cheesy. I didn't. Oh, see, didn't, I am. I am cheesy. That's the problem. I, but I, yeah, I, I'm like, I like. Oh, you know, my poems. I'm like over the top guy. So you yeah. know, but you only live once. Me too. But the thing is, is that. Um, but I, I hadn't even really read it. I just like. Yeah. I remember, I never heard of him. I remember finding this in a bookstore because, you know, I came up through the modernists, right? Mm -hmm. And Ezra Pound was like a gateway drug for me, you know, when I was like 15. Wow. I learned so much about the history of poetry. And that's what he gave us is this, you know, the fact that if a poem's any good, it's always good. Yeah. And, you know, and he also was this amazing person, an animist who could reach into the seventh century or you know, 8th century BC, and he could bring out the absolute spirit of that moment and, you know, and create a persona, which is what his, you know, early poems are called. He, right. wore, a, he wore a mask, which is yeah. kind of what we all do as poets. It's like Spicer's After Lorca. I mean, when you're young, you read X and you try to write like X. Right, right. And you can't write like X and you realize really quickly, no, you can't. You yeah. fail that, but what you begin to realize, oh, this is I'm this is who I am. And this is what I mean by the affiliated voices. Like all these things, all these various things that have given us wings, they're in us. We just we perform them in this other way, you know. And I feel like all the poets that I love, um, I don't know. I think that there's a custodial duty to being a poet. I think we bring them back into the world of light and speech. Mm -hmm. We love them, we love one another. Like we're like this. Yeah. I mean, so I always feel like I'm contemporary with, you know, uh, who, I don't know. You mean the dead? Like a first century poet, a seventh yeah. century poet. Like to me, if it's any good, it's, it's, it's always present. And that's a beautiful technology of poetry. And what is that? And that's trying to think about it. Maybe it's because like what Rilke is giving us, there's really only kind of, there's really like a basic set of things that we experience in this thing we call living and so like 
poems somehow are these renditions of these basic things, which is desire, loss, anger, frustrate. You know, it's like it's like we have these set things we go through, and maybe that's why they're just they've been so companionable all these years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm going to take all that away. What I want to say is the three things that I most love about poetry and what I'm interested in is mystery, mm -hmm. presence, and intimacy. Mm -hmm. Those are the three things that I love. And that's all here in the Rilke. Yeah. So when I was 20, I found this book, this David Young translation in a used bookstore. And I came home, I was like, this is mind-blowing. I'd be like reading it to my friends. Can you, I, I actually thought I discovered Rilke, you know? And then, <laughs> and then to one of my and then one of my teachers like, uh, no, he's actually quite well known. Yeah. But the Duino elegies, you know, like we think about spring and all, or we think about, you know, harmon we think about these long poem sequences that were written in the first part of the 20th century. The Duino elegy is simply one of the greatest, you know, right. sequence poems that we have. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's, it's, yeah. You know, I'm not a fan of the sonnets of Orpheus, I must confess. Oh, really? Yeah. Eh, I don't know. This is like, this is like undone and unstrung. Yeah. The elegies are just like, they're big and messy and they're constantly contradicting themselves. And yeah. like, like that whole thing we try to unpack about the father tasting, it's like, um, I don't, I can't say for me, I mean, I guess if we have, you know, a real scholar here, they could break it down for us, but. But it doesn't mean one it, thing. I, it's, that's, that's, that's exactly that's what, that's right. what I was, Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's I mean, it, it's like yeah. everything is set up to be unpacked and unpacked forever. And he didn't even, yeah. he, he didn't have it all worked out, surely. I mean, nobody, no poet, real poet does, right? I mean. No, I'm, I'm constantly discovering my work. Yeah. It's like, that's why poetry is so unique. You know, I, and I talked with Daniel Todd on his podcast about uh, philosophy. Daniel who? Daniel who? Daniel Tut. He's 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 a philosopher and Marxist. Okay. okay. And and he's wonderful and he's doing such good work. But anyway, we were talking about philosophy and poetry and the the age old um sort of rivalry between them and Plato banishing the poets and all that. But you know, there's something about philosophy where in a way like it has to be mapped out in advance the argument uh defendable laid out and having part, you know, in you you can you can deconstruct it in this really interesting way but with poetry it's like i think people feel unnerved because it deals with philosophical issues but you can't say uh oh, this is this poet's argument against this poet's argument and even though roca has these um beliefs and tendencies that he's going towards the importance of this sort of um inwardness that needs that, that is important in iron you know contradictor in, in in a contradictory way to looking outward and things like that but none of it it's all so um well like you said they contradict each other from poem to poem and he keeps turning it and seeing a different angles and and it's strange and mysterious but it's but, also real that he contradicts i mean that's like yeah it's re it's it mimics it's reality yeah yeah and Oh God, that reminds me of something you were saying earlier, which um take your time. Oh, you were you were in in the beginning of our conversation, you were talking about the poem being uh some what was the word you used about time? Um that it that it 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 disrupts the clock and opens time to a different time signature. No, right. Um exactly. And when when you think about how we've almost we've constructed time, <laughs> that there's something about the poem that it's like it creates the it, it yes it disrupts time because that is almost that that is what is reality is like this dis this out of time time that that it has this consciousness that's bigger than the body, bigger than the self, bigger than the eye that can lead out into nature and, and can go back in time and forward in time. And, but is constantly present. Mm -hmm. There's this in presence. Yes. The pure event maybe establishes. Well, no, I mean, I think the word that you like is consciousness. Yeah. Consciousness is presence. 
Yeah. You know, and the thing is, consciousness is something we share. Yeah. Right? It's like we it's like we all it's like we have these instruments that we tune shit in. It's like we share it, you know, yeah. and on all the studies that have been going on in the world with, you know, I hate digital culture, but um, they have all these recording instruments now and they can now they can now pick up sounds that are, you know, here's our range. It's like a mid band and then all below it and above it, they can now capture all of these sounds in the natural world. And it turns out that every single thing is speaking mm, and, so is art great. and is articulate. Actually, has it has like an articulated language. It's yeah. like mammals oh have- Oh my God. And mammals have individuated sounds for each one of its offsprings, right? Oh. Uh, it's like if you play water, you know, 30 feet away from a plant, this, like a speaker, the plant will grow towards the water sound. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. So everything's awake. I mean, every yeah. so what is what is that? It's not the way in which we, our instrument, our wetware understands consciousness, but everything is alive and speaking. Well, when you were talking about, uh, I'm this sort of vehicle for the voice as I make the poem. You know, if if one could be somehow in a state that is able to write the unseen language and the unheard language that we don't even know somehow to translate that and to be in conversation with it within the within art right maybe too i think when rook was talking about oh the the um the stage in which um we can sit down and let the play finally begin mm -hmm. is when we're able to make art and be in some side of some sort of concert with or harmony with the greater yeah. consciousness of being, which is yeah. beyond, you know. And he brings up constellations and stars in this book. Right, and, he does. And so to me, right, from boyhood on, I'm a space nerd, but always have been. But I guess if I had an autobiographical piece in my work, I guess the journey for me I've come to identify over years is that I just want to be the right size. I don't mm. want to be, I don't want to be bigger or smaller than anything. Mm. I just want to be the right size. I want to be tuned. Right. And one of the ways that I came upon this was just as a boy standing. I mean, I don't know about you. I had serious Catholic training. They're constantly putting God in me. You know, it's a big ask for a seven-year-old. It's like nonstop yeah. God. But then, you know, I'm trying to really figure it out. My father was a scientist very devotional. At any rate, for me, where I grew up in the Western Mass and the Berkshires, you know, the sky was black and you could see the entire milky band. And I remember just standing there under that as, as a boy looking up and just realizing, wow, I'm part of everything and I'm nothing at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And it felt, it felt incredibly, it just felt, yeah, it just felt like a majesty to realize that I, I, I am part of this and I'm like, just a, not even, I'm just like a piece of it. But, every, yeah. Go ahead. Well, it was going to say, it reminds me of you saying too, that, that realization that the world has nothing to do with me, but at the same time, it has everything to do with you because yeah. you make, you make it, you we, make the world. I have that line in one of my poems in the beginning, landscape is a made thing to see the mind seeing itself. Mm. the sea thought a wing and night the long brooding and it goes on any rate yeah uh. so but you know embarrassingly talking about this elegy and thinking about my poem i who sent me it's just like wow rook is like he's like he's like uh you know i don't know what's the word? underwriting a lot of what i'm doing yeah which freaks me out like because even like the migratory bird and all of that like i'm gonna read that poem okay yeah please Okay, I mean, it's... it's so not, this is your poem called... This, this is my poem that you mentioned, which everyone seems to mention, which is a weird poem to me. It's called, I Am Who Sent Me. But I'm thinking of it in relation to what we just read in the fourth elegy. I am who sent me. To have died in youth and remain. To be good with that. To forget now who was speaking. Someone was always speaking. 
to be in the yesterday of today, lost in the morning psychotropic green. But the verb is to be, to be vigilant and hungry across time, along with the words I love, blinking in the face of it. Look for faces and you find them everywhere, that leafy elm becoming a mouth. Overhead, voices angular and taut rebound in space with an antique question. Where are you now? Now only words for lost things, language marching into empire, starving the words. Light throwing rhythmic shadows, Doppler and strange. Where are you? Things for last things. Still at this almost moment, a voice to come as sunrise and remember the mother and the father everywhere inside migrating birds. So brief, so gone. This was the legacy of dew. To learn these origins as the origin of water. Unguarded, you wake and open into your face. Freestyle, fathomless. To see that far into oneself with only a tear for a mirror the shape of it, I keep it close as a shield against time. Mm. <laughs> it's just like, okay. Um, I just fucking love that line so much to see that far into oneself with only a tear for a mirror. Yeah. That's just so good. Mm. But, yeah. I mean, and then, you know, like the mother, the father, the migrate, it's like there's a mm -hmm, lot of mm -hmm. stuff. It's a lot of, it's just yeah. Yeah. I, it, I mean, Roka's here. I mean, I don't know. I Roka is here. I, I, I mean, but it's not just that Roka's here. Yeah. Is that you're both in the same world, and you both are tapped into these. You know, yes, they're archetypal. Yes, they're shared. Yes, they're ancient. I mean, that's why. You know, I was at this talk that Emily Wilson gave on the Iliad this morning, you know. It was oh, like, how was that? It, it was beautiful, you know. It was beautiful. I just read her I just read her Odyssey, by the way. Go ahead. Well, Ben just read the Iliad. Um, he just did a little class on it and he's been reading me. Awesome. Parts. Yeah, it's just it's awesome. And she you know, she was showing different translations side by side, and I just then coming to her translation, I was just it, you know, it, I'm so appreciative of it. Um, because I she, feel like yeah. Well, she really under she has a sensibility of a kind of, of the poetry that just gets at the nuance of the language that I I just adore. But I was thinking about the ancientness of it, and that you know we think of ancient texts as just ancient poetry that's not relevant to the, the concerns we have now. But it's amazing how not at all. It's it, now. you know there's different contexts socially, of course, and yeah. they mean different things to us now. Like oh, you know honor was like very different then than we understand honor now so we have to consider that when reading it things like that but but the point i'm making is that you know we have these influences whether we realize it or not from all the poetry that's come before us that's it and and it's not and and it's because we experience to the mother and the father and the phenomenon of migrating birds and the metaphors within those things which are not just decorative no. You know, that they're, they're full of living meaning and yeah. reality. And so so we're all they, tapped they... into that. <laughs> but it's like we all sit, there's like a subtle difference in how everybody makes their poem. So this the individual writer, even if they're Homer and God knows where he got it all from, is like it, it that matters too. Cause like um for some reason the individual experience, like we were talking about the autobiography, somehow that inflects and informs how the greater conversation is turned and looked at at different angles, right? Because we all have nuanced experiences that things aren't just all the same and no. yet they're shared. Well, yeah, you have to, yeah, it has to, yeah. You have to make it new, as they say, you have to make it. Yeah. Yours. That's what she was saying too. Is but the thing it. about, you know, I mean, Homer is just like, here's the thing. We keep thinking that like the human records long, Remember when I turned 50, I was like, boy, what if I have a party and I had 49 other people in the room who were all exactly 50 years old, like me at this moment? So that's 50 people. Okay. And if we had 50 people who were all 50 and you could somehow take that aggregate age, which you would, if you add it up, it's 2,500 years. But if you could like line them up chronologically, we would be back 
in the fifth century Athens. We'd be back. Wow. In, right. Yeah. So that, that's like, 50, <laughs> yeah. that's like 50 people between me and that. It's, yeah. It's, that's not even a big party. It's I crazy. You mean. Yeah. No, right. And yeah. it's like, if I had two other people, I'm, I'm around when Dickinson and Lincoln are, yeah. around, you know, so yeah. it's like, so this idea that it's like, you know, I don't know. It's like, yeah, if we read about civilizations, uh, you know, yeah, we have better medicine, but we also have better. But weapons. imagine all the incredible poetry and epiphanies and truths that have come before us that we're still trying to parse out and so much that's lost to time. I mean, there could have been the most important and crucial epiphany about man and humanity that somebody had thousands of years ago and it's lost now, but it will come back somehow, well, you know? Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, so much of what we have from the ancient world, we have by accident. Yeah, you mean that we still have it? Yeah. It's by accident. We have something, I know, like, and fragmented. We have something like 15% of it, you know? Um, yeah. Or if that, but, but Homer is definitely not one person because basically it's basically, you know, decades and decades of rhapsodes, people who perform texts, you know, performing these different sagas, because every figure in the Odyssey and in the Iliad, every player comes from a town and they have their own saga about that, that warrior. So like, uh, what Homer uh. does is Homer takes all of these various sagas and then he weaves them together or whoever is woven together to make this kind of larger tapestry. Mm. And that's what's incredible. And the reason there's all these repetitions all the time is because it's almost like, you know, it's like a song, it's like a hook. You can, you can, you can freestyle and then you come back. You can freestyle right. again and right. then you come back. Because, you know, it's like it wasn't written down until the sixth century, right? right. But so it, exi have these it existed for 300 years anyway as an oral yeah. text. So, yeah. So it's definitely, you know, it's definitely not the product of a single author. But then this goes back to what I'm trying to say. Even you, Bianca Stone, your writing might not be your writing might not be the product of a single author. No. You see what I mean? It's like yeah. you're made up of all of these other voices, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, okay. So it comes through you, but it's I don't know what I'm trying to say. But well, Homer, I mean there's Homer's there's am the, Homer's amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's the direct influence of other writers that I've had throughout my life and poets that I read that I feel and consciously and unconsciously in conversation with. But then there's this sense of, you know, I have these little moments of like feeling this sense of um, something much older that, you know, of course, of course, it's all it's part of our bodies passed down, passed down, passed down, passed down, all the way back to the first, you know, strange thing that split into two and had a thought and died, you know, it's like that little tiny first thought that ever was is probably in all of us. And and it took, by the way, billions of years for, you know, like maybe the first single cell thing that was alive was years, 4 billion years old. So there's like 3.5 billion, they think. But by the time we get to complex life, it's not that long ago. Yeah, it took, it's it took really long, not. It took a long time to like, and so. And look what happens is like, and, we're and, like but, killing but, ourselves. And the universe, Death you know, the, 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 gal same. the galaxy we're within, you know, what's the likelihood that there's another, you know, planet that has life on it as we know it? It's probably not likely. I mean, it could definitely be likely in other galaxies, but, you know, we might be it for the Milky Way. And, um. And for whatever reason, we've been given like these eyes and ears to like, to witness. And yeah, to witness. I mean, to me, that's like, I to look. Know. I guess if we just kind of focused on that as a people, it might be different. Um, I mean, we're not a planetary species at all. Like planetary species means that we all live in harmony with everything. And we're not even close to that. So that's a drag. It is uh, a drag. I mean, it's, you know, I was walking to the get the trash can or I was walking the dog and then getting the trash cans and it was dark out and I was like really scared walking in the dark and then I was like all of a sudden I thought of deer and bears in the woods that just live in the dark in the woods and they're just part of 
I, it sounds so dumb and simple when I say it out loud, but like, no, I, know. I, I had this sudden like, like experience of like, oh my God, like I'm so removed from being like, just in the woods, in the dark, and this is where I belong. Or just con so connect, removed. connect, connect it to the sun, basically. Yeah, which is yeah. not, which is not not connected to the sun either yeah i i mean the other thing about the electric light or fall i mean that's like yeah it's i mean again this stuff is all new right yeah oh i, mean, I love did you watch the have you do you like david lynch of course i'm like really into the the twin peaks season three you mean, the, the return i mean the, the, new, the, the 18 part one the new yeah the new yeah, series yeah. he did i just it's finished it might, it might be the greatest thing he's ever I, done I, I i i was like so fucking sad when i watched the last episode that i i was like i because every episode i just savored i loved it so much right but he so has this obsession with the electric plug and, and electricity and that something happened it, there you know something well something happened when we made the bomb and that blew up and that sort of like opened some sort of let, let let some evil into the world that exists you know I, I one thing that's so great about that is that he shows he makes a, a an actual scene a material thing out of the unseen and archetypal events of the mind but what's important about him doing that because plenty of people like oh make magic into a fiery ball that they throw but the, somehow what david lynch does that he's so masterful at is that it's so connected to the living people's weird world that it's like what mm -hmm. i'm saying is it, it's 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 a metaphor and not a metaphor and that's how he shows it it's like it's perfectly uh um it's perfectly but, fantasy and reality at the same it, it's well, almost like uh, yeah but you know he makes his work out of like a deep practice of meditation so it's completely does like, he oh yeah he's 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 a big member of transcendental meditation his whole life oh. oh yeah so what he does is everything he gets his paintings his scripts his ideas it all comes from meditation and so oh, what what what, what, we, so what we what we respond to though is that kind of like that particular like logic or illogic that logic that he has that allows for disturbance it allows for like you know contradiction but really it just allows for like mystery like you can't mm -hmm, see it mm -hmm. all you can't see it all like the figure of kyle mclaughlin in that in that series where he's like, oh, he's like a like a golem he can't speak you know he's constantly... oh yeah, yeah but Jones. that's like but that's what yeah. it's like that's what it's like to have a dream when you're paralyzed right it's like having it's like having sleep paralysis it's like you know it's coming i mean yeah. i don't know it's so unsettling but, but we've all yeah. had it you can't. But uh, but to the Kyle, Kyle McLaughlin evil Cooper doppelganger guy, know, you know, know that's part of us too. And then in the final episode, it's very fungible between the two the two of them. Even though he's gone, you still see glimpses of him. And so that's again that like yes, these are all parts of our psyche yeah, and, and, and selves, but and they're made and they're sort of, they're separated and made into symbols. And, but that's what happens in our dreams. And our, you know, I see these people kind of same kind of people in my dreams. Some are sadists, you know, and some are and manipulative. Some are feel so benevolent. They have like, you know, random, they're random seeming, but I, I've had this belief too. And well, I have a knowledge that yes it's in my head and not real and immaterial and yet it's some part of it is completely real no it's absolutely and, real and a consciousness separate than my own that is also part of my consciousness and it yeah. comes in and out and that's why we can have that's why in myths we can recognize certain figures yes you know and it's like oh yes that figure that that trickster figure you know mm -hmm. he's he's like a real thing it's like a real phenomenon um, yeah i agree and you know what i've always thought why, you know, uh, Jung talks about the collective unconscious and this yeah. idea of the recognizable, you know, um, types, archetypes. Okay, so this is interesting, right? For tens of thousands of years, the human animal negotiated space through the sky, through stars. Yeah. Right? So, like, that was the map. That was, like, that was how 
we negotiated like i know where you Speaking are because i know where the, the dark i know yeah. i know yeah. i know where the sun yeah. is right yeah yeah like it's all about that triangulation of this point in space that you know that height of the mountain and then where it's like so it's kind of like i don't know through this weird gear of the sky you know where your beloved is yeah you okay you know where the most intimate people are you know where your dead are buried but it's like we don't have that now now we have no google now, we have, now we have now we have google maps. maps we've got the internet we don't look up at the sky anymore yeah. my first book you know is called paraplume yeah and a, par and a paraplume is, is a way of reckoning through the stars it's an ancient form of reckoning oh yeah because why again about the space nerd it allowed me to accommodate a vertical imagination without being theist right oh i love that because yeah, i believe fine. It is. It's just like shit's way bigger than us. And the more yeah. science that I read, it's like it doesn't even diminish the idea that it's like some form of like just majesty, you know? Right. It's like a divinity in a way. I mean, it's just like it doesn't ever take the more we learn, the more mind blowing it is, the more right. we find out about stuff. And it's so fun to know that we'll never know everything until we're dead. And it's like, the not you knowing until we're dead we're not going to know it then what do you mean we're not going to what you think i dead, i you know? i thought maybe when we're dead we'd know <laughs> you know what i think i i've experienced so many losses in the last decade or more um and now i'm dealing with my own stuff and it's like i had this really weird this is you don't have to tape this but i was actually thinking that what if dying is like the ultimate orgasm yeah you know what i mean i think it's just, it must it's, be it's just like you yeah and you're just huh. you're you're just gone and you're yeah. just part of everything. Well, that's, there's, what I, that's what I want it to be. I, I don't think you're off, you know, because I mean we we know that that orgasming and set and death have been aligned before. Yeah. But there's of the course more. Yeah. yeah. There's the um I, I've experienced visually in my head the orgasm at the end of something very important, right? Mm -hmm. So there there's like um, it's so interesting because the erotic and the sexual and the lovers is such an issue for Rilke too. But in terms, Gee, not not for me. No, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right? well, I've got it all figured out yeah. over here. Um, I know it's it's actually that that element's been helpful for me too to just wrestle with because so many most people are not nuanced about the you know for them union and love is simplistic. Um, Really? I don't know. I don't know. In terms of like love poems, I guess. Oh, well, um, love poems are really. I don't know. Maybe it's, so, now that I say that, I'm like, that's not true. To no, I mean, everybody's within their, their ken, but yeah. I maybe love, songs. Love, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of Taylor love, Swift. love poetry is so yeah. hard to write. It is. But they're so great. I actually, I think that I've written some really good ones in this new book. Really... Oh, that's exciting. Wait, you do have a new book? No, I'm saying in my new book. Oh, in elegy. elegy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no. I, well, that's why I was thinking of Rilke's, you know, his, you know, he may fight against intimate love, you know, you lovers, blah, blah, blah. But he's also constantly on about lovers in here. And he was um, getting it on all the time. And I mean, yeah, he, had he, was, he, he slept with some major women. Yeah. And he just, he always had a woman and um, love was important for him. But yeah, I thought it, I I I saw that in this book too. There's so so much love here because I love. I'm here, you know. That's a, that top. The poem is over the top. I'm yeah. immortal because I love. I am here. No, in my outrage, I am a no. It's like, uh, what is it? Um, what Ecstatic is it? joy and its variance. Yeah, but what's the? It's like sure. Read the last like five lines. Like a seam through the sky, glitter. Sometime youth. Surely this is about the one thing you do to me, places not even music has touched. And in my outrage, I am immortal because I love. I am here. Great yeah. line breaks. See, and and all your line breaks here make it have multiple meanings, which I love. I don't know. I mean... That unfamiliarity with one's own poetry that you were saying, you know, I don't know what the fuck this poem is, you know, but approaching your poems and saying, ah. Oh, but when I is... read it, but when I read it, I do. See, that's the thing. It's like when I give a reading, all to me is an occasion to visit with my work. Oh, totally. And basically that's... all I'm doing when we go to a, at least a good reading, 
we're listening to the poet listen to what they've done yeah that's why and, it's and every occasion is another occasion to discover it you know mm -hmm. So. That's why I, I I don't know about you, but I like reading is one of my favorite things. And yeah, we I, love it. We're good I, at it. We're, yeah. Yeah. But that, but it's also a great source of torment for me because if I don't like, think I gave a good reading or I read the wrong poems or yeah, 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 you know, yeah, something yeah. like I, yeah, 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 I'll yeah. fall into like the deepest depression for and not torture, self-torture. There is it. that, but there's nothing worse than going to a reading that sucks. That makes, me, that makes me hate poetry. Yeah. It, there's just so much, I mean, Bianca, there's just so much poetry now. And uh, and there's so much poetry that's my trauma is bigger than your trauma. And I just find it to be, it doesn't really bring us together. It only separates us. Um, I think the problem is aligned with what we've been talking about, which is people misunderstand the I and personal experience. And it's like narrative is so there's something about narrative that's so important to the poem that's so grounding to it and storytelling but it's not we you do, you do that really well see here's the thing like you love Sharon Olds she was your teacher etc you don't write anything like Sharon Olds like at all see, I don't you, write, yeah you, you love her it's like it's not even in your work and it's like but yeah there is narrative in your work right yeah and there is this notion that the voice is telling us something that could be a confession and we're overhearing something, but really the voice is just kind of like learning things as it goes in your work, right? That's what's great yeah. about it. And it, and and you are interested in narrative, but it's so circuitous and that, I don't know. I mean, it's just like, what's the next line going to be? What's yeah, the next, well, what's, what's the next I, line going to be? I don't want to. That's how I hear yeah. it. And I love that. Like, yeah. yeah. And you I, are you are a great reader because, yeah, because you yeah you just are. But as far as like not reading the right poem, I know that one, but that's bullshit, you know. And it's true that some readings are like I gave one at the church at St. Mark's two three weeks ago, and it was fucking great. I was there, I was present to every syllable, and so therefore everybody was present to every syllable. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And I sir, all I had to do, I, I just served my work. Yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember early on, I had to give a big reading at this festival, and uh, I was like nervous. That, and, and this older poet came up to me and said, "Okay, so it's great. You're allowed to be nervous now and insecure. It's great. And then when you get off the stage, you can be nervous and insecure. Right. But, but when you get on stage, all you have to do is serve the poem. Just right. read the poem. Just just read the poem. And yeah. as and as mundane as that sounds, it was like a real gift in my early life." It's such good advice because I, I I had like a personal realization that was similar where like I realized, oh, I have my poems up here with me. I don't, I'm not up here alone. You know, I'm yeah. here to like have the poem do its thing. And when I start reading, I always feel better. You know? Yeah, exactly. And they're way yeah. more articulate than anything I'm saying here today, which is like all over the yeah. place. Yeah. The, the, like I like what Spicer says in one of the lectures is at the end of his life, he says, um, the poems are right where I'm wrong. I always right. love that. It's true. Right. That's true. I mean, it's so good. I love it. it's true. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I think my poems know way more than I do. And they do. I like I want it that way. Well, that's why you can keep hearing them, you know. Well, that's I think that's what I was saying about the autobiography, which I, I just didn't finish that thought and I don't want it to hang, but go just just to say that like are, are uh there there's something in us and at work through us that knows way more than we do so we can't think that we know everything about our own autobiographical experience and what that means and what family is and what people want to hear about our family and our our life and our traumas we have to trans uh trans i think if, if transform we, yeah, yeah. We, we have to transform and transcend um what what we think we know and how we do that is to dream with it somehow right to to and and that's where things like free association can come in really handy yeah it's those... like you know and and musicality and form because if you follow the musicality and the form and you don't go into it thinking i'm writing a poem about this Never. and this is how i want it to come off and i want to come Never. off as the victim of this instance or i want to come off as you know in i want to come off as this is a love poem whatever it is um you you've got to go in with that unknowing openness 
and see what happens because well, you do you do start with an inkling usually but yeah no you start with you start with an impulse you start it's like a you start with an impulse and it's like a carrier frequency you know it like passes through you and then you start you can begin to attach yeah phrases and words and ideas and things to it you know and then you can shape it and then give that meaning you know and um that's what i mean about like i've come to realize that when i write i'm really being spoken you're being spoken yeah i'm not speaking i'm being spoken yeah. i love that when i write i'm being spoken you know what i mean it's just like well isn't that nice to be off the hook a little you know you don't have to speak and know and know you you no, I mean, in fact, I actually believe that not knowing is is a very useful tool to make meaning from. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just like it is. Yeah, that, that idea that Adam Phillips talks about, it, I, I think it was him, that um, not knowing is in service to knowing. So Yeah, where is that? Because, you know, I'm, in, I'm now in kind of correspondence with him. Oh, yeah, I love that he did it. Okay, yeah. It's I mean, amazing. It's, it's, talk on uh, on Peter Gizzi's poetry. It's great, and Skyler, who I love. Oh, and Skyler, I didn't. Yeah, know that. yeah. It was a bit, it was an essay. It's a talk I gave on Skyler, and then thirty pages of my work. And I wrote him, and I said, like, "Cause can I? This other person can you send me his address?" And I was like, "You have no idea. It's just like I knew Jimmy Skyler in my early life when I was a nascent poet, you know." Uh, and I only knew him for like four years because he died suddenly and we had big correspondence and he was so supportive and I think he's a god which he is and he was uh, so, one of my early influences he's a god he yeah. just is he's just he gets better and better and and time is telling us that and uh but I was like but the idea that 30 years later his work and my work would be in conversation mm -hmm in your company is like that's the gift I yeah mean, that's, that's like a gift yeah you know that's the prize baby that's yeah i'm prize. saying no that is yeah. the you know that's that the, is the fucking prize no yeah. that, that's the prize you're like yeah. the jasper johns it's just behind me you know what i, I mean see, it's so beautiful you know is that I mean? and you got a trevor wingfield behind you oh yeah i got a bunch yeah. of trevors i love it no i mean yeah i've known yeah we know good people yeah we do i wish you still did your cartoons though i actually really loved your cartoons Oh, I can't do it anymore. No, it's yeah. fine. But I love them because I'm glad they were great. I just I, yeah. I thought they were really good. Yeah, I think I you know I was just yeah. looking at the Ann Carson book again and thinking about it and stuff. I, I had to do a talk on it. So I was looking at it again. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe someday. Whatever. It was what you did then to find out, learn something. I know it's such a psychological phenomenon, though. I can't. I, your, your new, I, I'm really loving your new poems, though the ones I've read and the ones mm -hmm. I've heard. Thank you. You know, and then I love, I love. There's so many great poems in your recent book. Mm. Uh, yeah, it really is. I mean, the Jesus poem is just off the chain. Oh my God, I like read that. That's an amazing poem. What's the first? Th was it like Jesus didn't realize that he was a simile? Like, what's oh, the first yeah. line? No, it's so good. Can you remember? Yeah, it's like uh, they say. Jesus couldn't admit to himself that he was a simile. Yeah, so great. Um, so great. You see, the thing is, you get a phrase like that, you can go anywhere. Yeah. That's yeah, the thing. You yeah. got to catch a phrase. And then that's what I'm saying about the character. You catch that, that. That is a large enough idea that you can make anything happen underneath that. I mean, catching those and phrases, that, that's what a poet, that's how you, I'm looking for those, you know, I'm looking. Well, that's why those. I haven't started a book yet, you know, because yeah. I'm, I'm waiting like the first poem in Fierce Elegy is called Fine Spot Unknown. And I was like, okay, uh, you, go to, you go to a museum and you'll see an artifact, 800 BC Assyria. And then you go to the next artifact that says Fine Spot Unknown. And yeah. I always loved that. It. It's like, oh, I see. It's an artifact of an unknown origin. Oh, wow. So cool. that, that's just yeah. like a, it's just like a poem. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and it was like, oh yeah. So what does that mean? it's a thing it's a real mystery it's a thing yeah. it's a real mystery yeah and so that was like that allowed me to then for whatever reason the first poem in all my books is the first poem of that book yeah and it'll it's an idea i love that that's <laughs> large enough that then i could the book just happens i haven't gotten it yet but now that it's done i have no excuse i have to start all over again i mean i have one small poem but i can't 
it doesn't open a book. Well, this so, came out last I, year. I mean, yeah. Can I, can I recite it to you? It's short. Do you mind? Yes, please. Okay, I'd be honored. Okay. Suddenly, street light can do things other light can't. All that was to be was what it was, clownish light, nothing more. Then suddenly you find yourself in something's abject glory, a trill of color on dirty winter ice. Street light can do things other light can't, to wander the soft dark outside the circle of light, ragged circle from the street light. It was always this way here, darkness like expression of doubt spills over when excess thought leads to starlings, a geometry taking wing.